Good morning to the church. Good morning to all of you, those who are watching via live stream. It's a privilege to stand before you and proclaim the word of God. It's been a while, and I believe that God always knows what he's doing. He's working it out definitely. So we don't have to fear. We don't have to just sit back and wait on God and let him do what he has to do. Let's bow our heads. Almighty Father, we give you thanks. We thank you, dear Lord, for your mercies. We thank you, dear Father, and we give you thanks on how you have protected us, comforted us, been with us, and you would have taken us through those many difficult situations. You continue, dear Father, to look after us, and I pray that as we delve into your word, that it will come alive within us. Remove me now, dear Father, and show only yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's looking good in here. It's looking good in here. You definitely are looking good. I really enjoyed your worship, your singing this morning. And strangely enough, my topic really this morning is taken from the book of Psalms 137. And it reads like this, the first four verses. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we are reading from a new international version. When we remembered Zion, there on the poplars we hung our hearts. For there our captors asked us for our songs. Our tormentors demanded, demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And I responded, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a strange or foreign land? Now, if there were at church this morning in Salters, we would have been able to answer that question for them. You must understand that back in those days, what was really going on? And for your own reading, if you look at 2 Kings between chapter 24 and 25, we see how the children of Judah were exiled into Babylon. And what happened there? I mean, some real awful stuff went down. Under Zedekiah's rule, the city was seized by King Nebuchadnezzar's army. There was famine in the land. They decided that they're going to make a run for it, the king and his army. They were chased. The king was caught and separated. And before, and after he was caught rather, a sentence was pronounced on him. His sons were killed in front of him. And after, those were, after his sons were slaughtered, his eyes were put out. So the last thing he would have seen would have been the murder of his children. Nabuzaradan, the commander of the Imperial Guard, under the king Nebuchadnezzar, he set the temple of the Lord on fire, burnt all the, high, all the places, all the houses, every important building was burnt down. People were carried away into exile. Temple was looted, looted sorry. Pillars broken. And everything that stood, the army destroyed. They took everything. They totally annihilated the city. And everybody then was exiled into Babylon. So when they were asked to sing, how could they sing? Because they began to reminisce on the life that they had before. A life that they probably took for granted. 
they could no longer sing the songs of Zion. Because those songs were songs of joy. And they were in no way feeling joyful. I don't want us to focus this morning on that exile or how they actually got into exile. Even though it's important to understand where you are, where you are. But the more important issue is what are you going to do now that you are there? So we want to be focusing on verse 4. And I want us to highlight a couple of things before I be a couple of things. First of all, strangeness is temporary. Strangeness is temporary. And secondly, strange does not mean bad. The adjective strange comes from the Latin word extraneous, meaning foreign or external. It is defined as unusual or surprising or surprising in a way that is unsettling or hard to understand or accept. It also means not previously visited. So you can go to a foreign land, a place that you have never been before or encountered. It's unfamiliar to you. You're alien to that place. So we recognize that sometimes children can have some very strange ideas, foreign to us. And strangeness normally presents itself because of some sort of change. And we recognize that most of us don't really like to embrace change because there is some strangeness about it. When we have to move from our comfort zone, we are accustomed to doing things a particular way, feeling a particular way, and then that change comes about. There is this strangeness that is attached. Things now have to be done differently. We have to move away from what was the norm before and create what is referred to now as a new norm. We now have to embrace different practices, ways of doing things, new cultures, new personalities, as if dealing with the old personalities weren't hard enough. This transitioning stage can be quite difficult. For instance, you were in a job for many years, you're accustomed to making your own money, and all of a sudden COVID strikes and you're unemployed. Family to support. You don't know where the next cent is going to come from. How can you sing? You have spent most of your life with a loved one. And now they are no longer there. A strange place. How can you sing? You are accustomed to running and jumping and, you know, being alive. And now you got into some sort of accident and some limb, maybe your legs have to be amputated. You're in a strange place. How can you sing? Fire has destroyed your home and everything that you have worked for. How can we sing? This morning, we want to be looking at how we're going to deal with our own personal Babylons. We first have to accept that strange is the only temporary. Whenever we're doing something or experiencing something for the first time, it is always awkward. Remember when you first learned to drive, those who have license? I talk about the ones that got manual license, the real drivers. <laughs> Remember when the instructor tell you, okay, you gotta balance this clutch and you gotta ease off the clutch for the vehicle to start to move. And as you ease up, because it is a strange feeling to you, the vehicle starts to bump like it's going to kangaroo gas. And it's jumping and it, and it, you know, jumping all the time. But after a while, you got it. And then you, you watch him as he shows you how to change the gears. You come off the gas. You stick in the clutch. You select. Then you come back off the clutch and back on the gas again. Is synchronization of your hands and feet together. Probably hard for you to get, you know, grasp the first time you would have done it. Probably pull out a lot of the teeth in the gearbox when you first started. 
it seems strange to you at first, but after a while, you accepted and you moved on. The first thing we must establish is that God expects praise no matter the situation. It is not a requirement. Sorry, it is a requirement, not an option. God demands that he be praised. God demands that he be praised. So despite whatever land you are in, first thing, God demands praise. Remember Paul and Silas in the book of Acts chapter 16? If Fabian could pull that up for me, please. Sorry. Acts chapter 16. And while he gets that together, this is when they were in prison. A strange place. Anybody have ever been in prison? I don't know. But I don't think it, you could ever get familiar to being, you know, being there. In verse 23, Acts chapter 16, after they have been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And a jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received his orders, orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stalks. And in verse 25, it says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They began to let go some praise. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prisons, of the prison were shaken. And at once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. You saw what praise did? Now, Suppose we had to read this verse again. And we leave out verse 25. So, verse 24 would have ended, when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stalks. But there's no verse 25. What do you think would have happened? No verse 25. I believe all I know, they would probably be still there. Their feet will still be fasted in those chains. Had not for verse 25. Because they understood that when you begin to praise God, despite and in spite of where you are, chains are going to fall. That's why the psalmist had to declare that I will praise the Lord at all times. Not sometimes, or when I feel like, or when things are going good. Or when things are going bad, but at all times, his praise will continually be in my mouth. Sometimes our song may be a little off key. Still sing. Or we may be off beat a little bit. Still sing. You may have forgotten the lyrics to some of the tune. Make up your own, but still sing. The children of Israel lost their tomb because their joy was attached to a place. Hence, they wept when they remembered. A place that, as I said before, that they probably took for granted. I want to encourage you this morning. Do not let your joy and comfort be attached to material things or people. Rather, let it be attached to God. So whether you are here, there, or anywhere, you still can sing that song. You can still praise God in that strange land. That's why Philippians 4.4 4 tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. There's a verse that sometimes I normally have a little difficulty dealing with. First Thessalonians chapter 5.18. And everything give thanks. So you have to keep reading this verse over and over. You mean when I go into all these situations, you want me to give thanks? And I read this verse and I say, you know what? For me, I must say, in everything, I will give thanks. But I must admit, I don't give thanks 
for everything. There's a difference. There is a difference. In everything, giving thanks is different to for everything. Because I am not going to, I, you, it'd be hard to, I lose a loved one, and you want me to give thanks for that? Or I come down with cancer, you want me to give thanks because I get thank, cancer? But however, in that time, I need to focus on who God is. And what he would have done for me in the past. And for that, and in that situation, I am going to give thanks. Because I am going to remember how he has been good for me in the past and what he can do for me in the future. So in this situation, not for this situation, but in this situation, I am going to be thankful. I hope you are following me this morning. Therefore, we can consider it prayer joy when we face many trials. Because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. James chapter 1 verse 2 to 4. God wants you to be mature. He wants you to be complete. Change, if not handled well, can make you sick. It can throw you into a state of depression. So therefore, we need to be like David and encourage ourselves at times. God, there are, I'm going to tell you there are going to be times when you can't find a boy to encourage you. There are going to be times that even if people are around, don't care what them say, they're moving that pain or that void. But however, you can encourage yourself in the Lord. And in 1 Samuel chapter 30, we read of, the, of David, Zik-like experience. While they were away, and the Amalekites came and they burnt the place. Carry away the men, wives, or David's two wives were taken. And it says that David was greatly distressed for the people spit of stoning him. Because they were sad. They were in a strange land. Every man was depressed for his son, his children, for his wives and daughters. But it says that David, it didn't stop there. It didn't end with the sadness or depression. But it says David then encouraged himself in the Lord. So there are times that we must have a conversation with ourselves. We must say to ourselves, self, why my soul, why are you so cast down? Self, why are you disturbed within me? And as you begin to speak to yourself, you're going to respond, you know what? I'm going to put my hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Have a conversation with yourself. Babylon, even though it's a strange place, it may not be a bad place. Sometimes, even though we find ourselves in some strange places, with some strange practices, we must hold on to our faith. We must purpose in our hearts because we can excel even though we are in Babylon. We have people like Daniel one of the deportees and his friends who would have purpose in his heart that don't care what culture they found themselves in, they were not going to eat of the king's meat. They were not going to bow down to the king's music. I don't care how many people are bowing and eating. I am going to stick to what God has commanded me. I am going to praise God in this strange land. Whether bringing it a little closer to home, it is our, like our ancestors who were taken from, uprooted from Africa, packed like sardines into slave ships, and delivered as cargo across 
in the Atlantic Ocean to work as slaves in this very land, a strange land. But I talked earlier about excelling in a strange land. Now look at it. We now rule this land. So just because you are in a strange land doesn't mean you cannot excel within that land. You just have to hold on to your faith. Hold on to God. This pandemic has brought a strange Babylon to us. It has brought about some changes that we are not accustomed to. Even as I look throughout this congregation, all of you have your mask on. I only used to see that in China when I watching TV. Now it's here. We were wondering, how are we going to worship with these masks on? But y'all sounded very good to me this morning. It is, no, it is no longer as strange. But you have recognized that you can still carry your tune, mask on or mask off. You can still sing praises to God. People are being laid off. Economic doom and gloom is being predicted. Unemployment benefits are supposed to run out at the end of this month. Homelessness, as reported, is on the increase. Strange times. But we can still carry the same song. That God is good. That God is a deliverer. And that God is able. So we as a church, we are now in the recruiting business. We have a choir going on here. And we are asking you to join us as we sing to God. Whether you are here, there, or in that strange land this morning, we can still sing praises to God. Let's stand at this time. I don't know what your Babylon is this morning. I have my own personal Babylons to deal with. Those who are here this morning, those who are watching, each of us have our Babylons to deal with. But one thing we can be assured of is that we can excel. We do not have to stay in a spot where we are holding a pity party, but we can still rejoice. We can still sing praises to God this morning. Wherever you are, whatever situation that you are in this morning, God can still get that high note of praise from us. So speak, let's speak to ourselves. Encourage ourselves. Encourage each other. That even though in this difficult time that we are going through, and this time of uncertainty, that we know that the God who did it before can still do it again. That God that was able to roll those waters back, that was able to calm the storms, can calm that storm in our lives. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we thank you this morning that even though we are in some difficult places, we can still sing of your goodness and of your love and of your mercies. We thank you, Father, for all that you have done, how you would have been with us. And I pray, there, Father, even as you would have spoken to us this morning, that we will not forget your word, but that we, dear Father, will write it upon the table of our hearts. We bless you this morning. We bless your word. And we thank you for all that you have done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. May God continue to bless you. And as you think about your current situation this morning, wherever you are, even if you're at home watching me at this time, I want you to remember that God is able. Continue to sing your song of Zion. You may be seated.
And as the pastor came to this, as I even was preparing this message, the other day a guy came by me and he was saying, you know, there was, there was this guy that normally would do some mission field work with him. And the guy flew from wherever he was and he came down here to do some work in the mission field. And after they would have done their, their, their work, he said to the guy, a friend of mine, you know, why when I leave here, you know I gotta hit these streets now, I'm gonna look for my daughter who is hooked on drugs. 